I didn't do it. That's what I've been thinking to myself for the past 40 years. After all, it's true. I didn't do a thing. But yet, someone did. Someone did it. Something's yet to be explained. So, it's the 1970s and I got back home from investigating a murder. It's pretty simple stuff. A young girl gets murdered, her scalp gets removed. Pretty gruesome stuff, but for my job, it's par for the course. I'm not going to beat around the bush and pretend like it's a big mystery. You've read the title. I was a cop. I have been for 10 years. I love my job, despite the many weird things that happen with it. Now, I've seen plenty of paranormal crap, and maybe I can tell you the story someday. But none have been as personal as this. It started with my knives beginning to vanish. Now, you may be thinking... What does Knife's vanishing have to do with the horrific murder? Well, it didn't at first. It was just a massive inconvenience. The first time I really noticed was because it was Thanksgiving, and I was trying to get a knife to cut the turkey. I go to the drawer and there's pretty much two knives left. Now, I'm going to be 100% honest here. I haven't been paying much attention up until this point, but then I saw it, and I realized that the knives were gone. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't find the damn knife. It was that point in which I started to replace the knives, only for them to go away a few minutes later, with my back turned. To this day, I have no idea what the hell it was. At this point, my daughter was around five years old. Thus, it was reasonable to say that she could have taken them without knowing what it was. Perhaps she thought it was a childish game. I went to ask her calmly, I know I shouldn't given the situation. After all, my five-year-old daughter probably has my knives. Cecil, can you please give me the knives back? Cecil looked at me with a confused look. Knives, Daddy? What are knives? I simply replied. The little sharp things. The ones with the handles on them. I went to grab one. I grabbed one of the few knives I still had in the drawer, and I returned. Uh, like this, honey. They're dangerous, so I need them back. Have you seen any of these? No, I've seen the sharp man take one, though. At this point, I was confused. She had never mentioned this imaginary friend before, and this sounds like some horror movie villain. The sharp man? Yeah, the sharp man. He's funny. He's got black clothing on and a weird mask. But most importantly, he's covered in knives. He says he's friendly, but he can't show himself to you. He says that you'll be mad. He says I need to keep him a secret. Well, darling, I can assure you this sharp man isn't real. Now, I'll ask you again. Where did you put them? I don't have them. The sharp man does. Now, I knew this conversation wasn't going anywhere. And pressing harder wasn't going to accomplish anything. So I took a step back and I left the room. I went to find the knives in her room. They weren't there though. And I swear, I could have heard her say, The man is mad at you. He says you were somewhere you shouldn't have been. Now this was getting weird. She should have no knowledge about Harmony Way or any of the goings on in that area. And neither should any five year old kid. But she is my daughter, so I assume she had simply made it up. Naive of me, I know. I forgot about it, as a cycle of buying knives only for them to be taken away continued. It was annoying, but it wasn't scary by any stretch. Hell, if that were all this amounted to, you wouldn't be reading this. It would be a strange phenomenon of a young girl imagining a friend for her to play with. A few times within about a week between, I would try to get my daughter to explain about the knives. I mean, seriously, it's not funny at this point. I was starting to get pissed off. But one day, I'd say about seven months later, shit hit the fan. Pretty much I was relaxing in my room watching TV per usual. At that point, I had heard a scream. I thought it was just the show at first, but then I realized something. It sounded like my daughter. I went upstairs in a hurry to find the gruesome scene. 
As you can guess, my daughter was stabbed with the knives. All of them. And I mean all of them. Just hundreds of knives sticking out of her. Blood was pouring out, staining the carpet. Her organs were spilling out as well. Every bone was visible, and her skin was torn off clean, and not an inch of flesh remained. And now I was looking around like crazy at this point. I could have sworn if there was somebody who was lying around with my knives, ready to kill my daughter at any moment. I might have seen him. I didn't see anywhere that he could have hid. We hadn't found the guy to this day. And what's worse was what was on the walls. Don't go after me. Don't return there. I didn't do it, I swear guys, I'm not crazy. And after the incident, I was framed. Naturally, I was the only one that was home. The knives had no DNA except for mine, and hers. My wife divorced me, thinking that I did it. I didn't. Someone out there did though. Some sicko ruined my life and my family. And someday, I'll make them pay. Well, enforcing the laws for as long as I have, specifically around a decade or so, you'll see some strange things. Whenever it be horrific, like the time my daughter was murdered with my own weapons, or anything else, well, it's a wild ride for sure. And stranger still, if you're patrolling the area that I have. See, I patrol a small place in Texas, and within that area is an even smaller area. And this place would happen to be a road. A roadway, really. A shortcut that normally many people use. However... This place has a reputation for housing the odd, mysterious, and sometimes scary. This little roadway is known as Harmony Way. It's that one special place, central to all conspiracy theories. Now, as I mentioned, this is a small area. I'm talking teeny weeny small. So small I'm pretty sure nobody's heard of it except for the folk around here. Well, I guess until now. You see, as of late, the townsfolk are getting anxious. They're starting to tell stories about their Harmony Way experiences. And so, I thought to myself, why not tell a few of my own? After all, Harmony Way is the place where absolutely anything can happen. And well, absolutely anything does happen. Now, I probably won't begin to describe all the going-ons in the area, but I can at least fit in what I can remember. Story 1. The Deer Crash So, the very first one took place on my first day of work. I was pretty nervous. I was with my partner, Chris Granite, who was pretty friendly, although rough and serious. Before I go any further, I should probably tell you that this is one of the least scary stories that I've experienced, but it's the first run I've had with the paranormal of the area. So, I was patrolling the road. Yes, that road, and I happened to find a deer. I was observing it, just minding its own business on the road. And then, a car came by. It was speeding, way past the limit. It was about to hit the deer. And then the deer simply stayed still. The car was the one that was damaged. Thankfully, the driver was fine, and due to the accident at hand, I let him loose with a $100 fine so he could pay for his damages. I got reprimanded for the error later. Yo, Charles, what the hell? What? The guy crashed into a deer was perfectly fine. Yeah, odd shit happens. Welcome to Harmony Way. This guy knew what he was getting into. Speeding in Harmony Way of all places. Besides, we don't give tickets around here for speeding. We don't? Nah, not in Harmony Way anyway. There's a sort of unspoken rule about this particular street. Namely, if strange shit happens on Harmony Way, and a person is harmed from it, even if they are engaging in small-time illegal activities, so like speeding or texting and driving or something like that, well, we pardon it. Since the said paranormal experience is usually penance enough. So this stuff is on our side. He chuckled a bit, as if I had said something dumb. Charles, there's a lot you've got to learn. The things that go on in this area, it doesn't take sides. It just is. 
It's like nature in a weird way. Nature isn't an inherent good or an inherent evil. It's just neutral. In this game of life, you know. Yeah. After that, nothing else really happened around here. I packed up and I went home. Story 2. The Human Bird This is another relatively harmless experience. So, I was in my second week of patrolling the area and after a bit, I was finally tasked with patrolling Harmony Way again with Chris. We were just recovering from an experience with a missing kid in the forest, but you know, that's for another day. So, it was a few hours of boredom, you know, except for some speeders and a bit of cloud watching. You know, the whole this cloud looks like the state of Texas type of thing. And just when we were about to give up, we saw something in the sky. A bird. Now, you may be thinking, Charles, why are you talking about a bird? Well, there's one tiny little detail about this particular bird. It had a face on it. And not just any face either. This particular face was the face of my mother, who was dead for 10 years of Alzheimer's. Now, I'm no genius, but shouldn't this be impossible? I look at Chris confused and he nods. Let me guess, you know the face on that bird. I look at him in shock. How do you even know that, and why is there a bird with a face here even to begin with? Never mind my own mother's. It's like I told you before. Strange shit happens here. One day it's Elvis's ghost, and another day you get transported to another dimension for a few seconds. That's why we're here. To make sure people stay safe and don't end up dead. Dead. People die here. A brief pause. Anyway, that cloud over there looks like a donut, doesn't it? Story 3. My own doppelganger. Well, this marks the fourth time I've been in Harmony Way. The third time didn't really give me anything new. But the fourth time, oh lord, I mentioned Harmony Way gets scary. Well, this is my earliest experience of the true horrors of Harmony Way. So, I was patrolling the area per usual, stopping speeders, keeping the streets safer than they would be, although it's still relatively unsafe. I turned to Chris. You know, Chris, I've been wondering. Yeah? Chris turns to me. Well, so far, things haven't been very dangerous. You mentioned people dying. New topic. How was your day so far, Charles? No, I'm serious. Why isn't anything terrible happening? No demonic possessions. Chris looked around and leaned over to me. Charles, you don't want to talk about this crap right now. Not in the middle of the street. Why? He whispers. I think it has its own consciousness. It can hear us as long as we're in it. We have found this through experimentation. Oh, well, seeing the anomalies happening so far, I wouldn't be surprised. And I didn't see you as a threat, to answer your question. How so? The first thing to know... The more you know about Harmony Way, the more dangerous it is. Once again, it's been done through HQ experimentation. Just make sure to look the other way and you won't be in for much. I nod slowly. It makes sense after all. If this thing has a consciousness, it would be able to hear us, right? I don't inquire anymore. Not because there aren't a million questions running through my head. After all, Anybody working in this particular area is bound to drown in questions surrounding these anomalies. But rather, because we saw something. Myself. Specifically, I was walking across the street. There were a few differences, though. Firstly, the eyes were black. I mean coal black as if it didn't reflect light. I'd describe it as Vanta Black. That one shade of black so dark it doesn't reflect light. You've seen the articles, right? That was discovered partly from this. But that's another story. Second, the bean was way too tall. I'm talking super tall and skeletal, easily 10 feet in height. And lastly, it was twitching, very much so. 
Well, that wasn't actually the last thing. I lied. The last one came when it spoke. What are, what are you doing, doing here? here? Come, Come with, with me. me. I have I safety have from the end. the end. It was a distorted voice, like it was different audio clips attached together to form the sentence. Something seems suspicious. And then Chris declares, A pleasurable day it has been. The being hissed and got on all fours. I will find, find you eventually. eventually. And when I do, I, do. I will I kill you. you. We must, we must survive. survive. Everlast. Everlast. The creature quickly crawled away, swearing revenge at this point. I turned to Chris. I begin to ask, What was that? What did you say? How did you possibly know? Look, if you think this is the first time you've ever encountered one of these doppelgangers, you're terribly mistaken. In fact, they're incredibly common. That doesn't mean they're not dangerous. He begins to pack up. Don't let them touch you. Otherwise, you'll turn into a pile of boils and flesh. You'll have to be put into the Foundation's hands. And trust me, you don't want that. He packed up his things. After I asked where he was going, he said he had to report this incident to the Foundation. And that it was best I just went home for the day. Story 4. One Billion Hands and so at this point, I had been patrolling for about a month now. And now there is more paranormal shit going on, but it was mostly harmless stuff. And Chris came in about an hour early. He said it was a foundation meeting, although he isn't technically a part of the foundation. He just reports to the officers. According to Chris, they're the guys researching Harmony Way. I didn't know much about them at that time, though. So, his car came over to the parking lot. But then suddenly, it crashed. I saw a hand reach up and grab the tire, poking multiple holes in them. I looked down to see more hands reaching up to grab me. I just barely stepped out of the way before they could touch me with their claws, doing who knows what with me. So, I kept going across the entire road on my bare two feet. In hindsight, I should have gone for the vehicle immediately. But I was a dumb 20-something, not like I knew any better. So I kept going on my own two feet, still running away from the hands from the ground. And then the worst thing possible happened. Some guy clearly looking for an adventure to brag to his friends about, walking on the side of the road. Christ, the imagery. I saw the hands grab the poor guy, squeezing him tight. Muscles were visible, as the guy was being squeezed hard. All the innards of him were exposed as his leg gets squeezed tighter and tighter. And then the boils began. They started to form absolutely everywhere on him, as the thing starts to thankfully let go. And soon enough, he became a blob of skin, muscle, and boil. As the arms started to go back underground, Chris came up, and marveled the mess left behind. Yeah, I remember the first time I'd see the handies get their victims, probably the single moment I realized. He then put his hand on me, this isn't going to be one of those jobs you simply quit. We're here for a reason. And we're here to stay. This is going to stay with us forever, probably. Back your stuff. We're going to the Foundation. Thank you all for the support of the last entry. I'm really glad everybody enjoyed my adventures in Harmony Way. And I'm looking forward to showing everybody more. You know, it's funny. I may have been put in real life endangerment in the past. But now, I can look back on it with a strange sense of nostalgia. Story 5. The Foundation This story is a continuation of the last one. You know, when Chris was telling me to head on into the Foundation and all. This isn't all that scary, but the Foundation itself got really scary as things went on during the decade of work I've done. So, I entered the Foundation building. I looked around and I saw a white room, with men running to and from. There were many rooms and before I could go any further, Chris pulled me to the desk, with a stereotypical secretary looking lady. Hey there, Officer Red Spitting and White Lip, here to file a report. I looked at Chris strangely, and before I could ask, he turned to me. We don't use real names, we're assigned names, specifically names relating to snakes. 
I nod slowly. Okay. Chris turns back to the secretary lady. So anyway, we're here to report a D-127 class anomaly, which activated an A-2 class scenario. I am pleased to report there have been no A-1 class scenarios, however. I looked at him oddly for a few seconds, before finally putting my thoughts into words. What? He nodded understandingly and explained. It's code speak for. A, a doppelganger turned a civilian to mush and no civilian saw it happen. I nodded and I looked at the secretary. She looked at me and she replied. Ah, I must have forgotten. I'm Operative Garden, but you can call me Sheila. I reply. I'm Red Spit. Chris interrupts. I'm Red Spitter. You're White Lip. Oh, well, I'm White Mouth, but you can call me Charles. Chris replies. No, she can't, and you can't call her by her real name, either. It's Foundation Policy. I threw my hands up in the air. Whatever. Chris told Garden. Report the incident to the Overseer. Will do, Red Spitter. See you later, White Mouth. I waved back at her before Chris pulled me forward and pushed me out of the door, as he went with me. Story 6. The Return of the Deer So, as corny as it sounds, the deer had returned that day. You know, it always returns every time I'm there. Chris says that it's always there, every day at the exact same time. 9am. I saw the deer there, and I swear it was looking directly at me, with its red, beady eyes. I asked Chris, Does it hurt anyone? Well, it's a 50-50. A 50-50? How does a deer murder people? Trust me, when you've been here long enough, you'll come to despise everything about that deer. Why don't we hunt it down? You know, shoot it and whatnot. We tried. The bullets bounce off toward the person who shot the bullet. So it kills the shooter. Yep. It's also carnivorous. As he said this, I reached down and ate a bunch of rabbits. Swallowed them whole. I swear that I saw its teeth get sharp. As the purple crescent on its head started to glow, it walked away on all fours and vanished midair. Chris turned to me. Yeah, it does that. If I were you, I'd get used to it. And not get close. Story 7 The Little Kid now, if you're anything like me, you find little kids scary. That feeling only increased after this experience. So, it's been a few months since I joined the police force and the first story had occurred. I had done my fair share of trying to track down missing kids, but this had to be one of the most frightening. See, this was a family who had lost the three children a few years back. Supposedly, there's an ongoing investigation to find them. The key word here being, supposedly... I went to the home with Chris. He pulled me to the side and he explained. You see, Charles, in October there's usually many missing children cases. Almost triple the norm. The reason we don't explain the phenomenon is because we know what's making them all disappear. I tilt my head in confusion. If you know so much, why don't you go after it? It's not that simple. It's an anomaly. The nature of this anomaly is unknown but we have given it the D-98 class rating. Thus, the disappearances aren't a police matter. They're a foundation matter. They've been hunting this thing for years, but so far, it's a no-go. Right now, we've got to pay lip service to the family here, and then watch this Halloween for any phenomenon. You got it? I nodded slowly. He adds, And don't be a hero either. Every new officer tries to be a hero first Halloween, and every year, they just barely make it out alive, if at all. So, if not for your sake, don't die for my sake. I nod and we both knock on the door. An elder woman and her husband came out. The woman sobbed on my shoulder and Chris shook the husband's hand. Chris said, We've been making strides to try and find the monster. He looks at me. They're responsible for this. The woman looked at Chris. Thank you, I'm sure you'll get him. You have to. Chris replies, We will most certainly try. And with that, the two of us went off. We looked around a bit and first on the street, 
and then into the woods. And that was when we found something. It was a clearing about 10 feet wide. It was a large circle of nothing but dirt. And then I turned around to see a little kid. It wasn't the kid we were looking for, but it fit the bill for another kid. I told you, there were a lot of missing children. So, I naturally went to talk to it. Chris put his hand on my shoulder. Don't be a hero, Charles. I looked at the kid. I asked for it to speak. Chris started to yell. Charles, you don't want to. You... You, you are, you here. are here. It sounded wrong. Like it was multiple tapes all modified to look like they were from the same clip. But it failed horribly. Either way, we decided to run. But I swear, when I turned around slightly... I saw a large gray blur charging towards me. I saw lots of teeth too, lots of sharp ones, and there were legs all crawling towards us. Other than that, the creature is too fast to see. Afterward, it was a sharp sting, the deepest pain that I'd ever felt, and then blackout. I woke up in a foundation with a deep gash on my stomach. Chris and Sheila were looking over my hospital bed. And so were a few men in lab coats with blank white masks, as in all white. I wonder how they could even see. Gosh, White Lip, you had me worried there. I told you not to be a hero, not to talk to the thing, not when you're in its territory anyway. Sheila added, I was so worried, so scared that you wouldn't wake up. And with that, she stroked my cheek a bit. It tickled somewhat. I looked up at her and I smiled. And Chris put his hand on my shoulder and said, Gardener and I will head back to the main desk to report what had happened. You heal up. This could be a while. And as they walked out of the door, I started my three months of hospital time. Turns out, there was poison in my system. When I did get out, I learned caution. And caution would aid me in my travels. Because oh boy, things didn't get much better from here. Story 8. The Lights in the Sky So it's been about a year now. I've gone through my life's share of terrible monsters and ghouls. But if I were to tell you about each and every one of them, we'd be here all day. And this would be about a 200 part story. Now, I don't want that and probably neither do you. But needless to say, I didn't find anything else out about the Foundation. During that time, one mission I had was to find info about the Foundation. After all, when in the vicinity of such a strange organization, how could one not? In the meantime, I have been getting closer to Sheila. Not using her for info as she knows about as much as I do. But in a way, I don't get close to most people. But this isn't about that. Although I was pressing Chris on the matter. Chris, I've been wondering... What's up, bud? Are you a part of the Foundation? Nah, I just take orders from them and I'm told to report to Gardner about incidents that I find. I've actually never met anybody else besides her that works there. And I've never been anywhere within that facility that isn't the hospital or the meeting room. The only thing I know that you don't know is all the coding. Not true. I've been brushing up on my code lingo. A class is a civilian. B class is staff. C-class is Harmony Way, D-class are the Anomalies, and E-class is Leakage and Whistleblowers, right? Yeah, you forgot about I-class though. And what about F through H-class? There is no F-class. G and H-class is for high-ranking employees only. I-class is in the case of D-class since a break into the facility or out. Out? Oh, yeah, out. The second to last thing I know about these guys... They have some D-class anomalies for studying. Isn't putting D-class and anomaly together redundant? They're the same thing. It's like saying, it's the toast time of burnt bread. It's the same thing. Yeah, but it's required. A foundation policy for some reason. Fair enough. Eventually, as we were watching over the road, we saw it. A bright light shining above the skylight. I tell Chris... I didn't think airplanes flew over here. And Chris replies, First, they do, rarely, but they do. And secondly, those aren't airplanes. 
notice how they're still. I look once again and sure enough, the light was still. And suddenly there was two. Uh, don't look into them for too long. That's an invitation. For what? Well, you get boarded on an alien spacecraft only for them to experiment on you and play some sort of chip and vaccine in you. They say it's immunity from the great disease or some crap. We know this because of the subjects brave enough to go through with the trial. I asked. And just out of curiousness, what happened to the subjects afterward? He then leans over and whispers. And they supposedly retire with a good financial reward. Enough that they wouldn't have to work again. Granted, they sign a license saying they'll keep mom. He then leans over and whispers. At least that's what I've heard, but I've had my doubts. I nod slowly, wondering more and more about this facility and what it has to hold. Story 9. The Foundation. An Investigation. So... Ever since I've heard that, I've been more and more invested in figuring out the going-ons of the facility. I've been planning a little sneak-in, alongside a friend of mine. So, you're sure it's today? Sheila asked. For sure. I replied as we head on over to the party store. If we're gonna enter the facility, we're gonna need a disguise. When we were shopping for lab coats, I looked to Sheila. So, if you didn't have a job at the foundation, where would you be? She replied, whispering back. Don't know. I got looped up in the foundation stuff because I was curious about the happenings of Harmony Way. After all, my dad was a Harmony Splunker. In case you don't know, a Harmony Splunker is somebody who frequents Harmony Way in order to figure out the mysteries behind it. She continued. But one day, he just didn't come back. No wreckage, nothing. Just gone ever since. I wanted to figure out what had happened. I asked her, What do you think it was? I saw her tear up. If you don't want to answer, you don't need to. I added, No, no, it's fine. It's just Harmony Way isn't the only mysterious factor in the area, and certainly not the only sinister one. I asked, What's the other? She replied, What I think... Don't tell anybody that I said this, but I personally think he was caught by the Foundation. That's why you're doing this, isn't it? You want to know what happened to your father? She nodded slowly. Changing the subject, I asked. If you had a kid, what would you name it? Sheila looked up. I've always wanted a daughter named Cecil. I smiled and I nodded. Cecil. That's a beautiful name. After we got our disguises, I start to drive to the entrance of the facility. But she comments that we're supposed to go the opposite way than usual, and pretty much behind Harmony Way. Once we got there, she pointed out the secret entrance inside of Sandy Hill. We both went in with our disguises on. The first thing we saw was a large room with a door to an elevator. Above was the display that read out the latest news and incidents. Basically, they were about incidents that I had never heard of. G, H, and I all the way down to Z and A. Whatever those were. Anyway, there was nothing on Sarah and not even Sheila knew what they were. So we went down to the elevator. There was a slot for a key and the buttons for each doors weren't lit up. We tried pressing them, but it was no use. It seems like I need some kind of key. I muttered. She remarks. Maybe we can find a key from one of the officers. I nod and I realized to myself. That's why there weren't any security at the front. If you don't have a key, you're not going anywhere anyways. And they can show everybody the news since nobody's going to understand anyway. Hell, I'm an officer and I only know up to E. I'm an employee of this place and I know up to E and then G and H. G and H? G class are incidents relating to experiments as to whenever they succeed or not. H class is whatever my dad was. Your dad? What did he say about it? He didn't know. All he said was that he was an H-Class personnel, and he didn't tell me what it was. So he worked there. I think. Be right back. I went and asked one of the scientists that I needed something. Sure, man, but I'm just an intern. The only access levels I got are one and two. You know they need to know basis of this place. Yeah, it's just a question. 
I put him outside and I knocked him out. I took the key from his pocket and I went back to the elevator. I put in the key and sure enough, the buttons for one and two lit up. I've been on one before my first day. It's just paperwork and applications. Try two. I press two and we go down to the floor. It's a subject training academy, as the sign says. And these aren't where the subjects are. There's a large sign that said, five minute break. Thus, the subjects were all in the court. I turned to Sheila. We can interrogate them. How? I reply. I'm a police officer, it's kind of my thing. I went up to one of the subjects and I asked, Hey, how did you get here? The subject wearing a white mask with a smiley face looked at me. With a distorted voice, he replied, You see, I was dirt poor, and then this guy came up. A guy named guy Philippine. Named Philippine. He, said he, he said he had a job for me. A job, for a me. job that would pay a lot. Pay a lot. So, I accepted, so I accepted. And I didn't even know anything, about this, know anything about this place. Just that I'm age class just personnel. Age class personnel. And, that everybody listens to the and everybody overseer. listens to the overseer. I look to Sheila and I go to her. Age class personnel. Like my dad. This means your dad is a... Before I could finish, the guy wearing my disguise as well as multiple armed guards all came into the room. There's one of the officers, he yelled. That's the one that beat me up. The officers without any word aimed their rifles at us. Before they could shoot, however, they were all shot in the back, cracking their armor. They turned around but whoever shot them was gone. We took the opportunity to get to the elevator and go up. As we got onto the elevator, we saw another officer. He leaned to us and muttered, You're welcome, Charles. I looked at him. Chris? He simply nodded. Yeah, I saw you guys both in a car heading here. I knew it was no good, so I followed. I asked, And you didn't rat us out? He replied, Nah, I'm starting to get annoyed by those guys anyway. They don't even care about us anyway. We're just a pawn for the larger game. And so are you, Sheila. We all are. Even the guys who tried to kill you guys. They're just taking orders in fear of the larger enemy. He looked down and he finished. In fear of the overseer. And even then, I'm not entirely certain he's the head honcho of it all. Or if it even goes deeper than that. We leave the elevator and quickly escape. Ditching our disguises and heading back to the car. Rushing home before they could track us. Story 10 the vision. Chris and I were on our first job since the incident at the foundation. And truth is, we weren't called back for a while. We were stressed out. But apparently, she either reported that this kind of thing isn't that big. We didn't find any valuable information, after all. But Sheila had been digging deeper into her father's history. She's done a bit more underground work. Meanwhile, our jobs are much more mundane. And that is until a few hours in. I blinked and suddenly the world shifted around me. Weird blue bubbles appeared everywhere, blue strings were attached, and as I turned around to see Chris, I saw little more than a husk of his former self, covered in the blue bubbles and strings. He muttered, Everlast, Everlast, Everlast. Everlast. Beware, beware the great, the great virus. virus. I blinked and the world returned back to normal. I asked Chris, Why were you a weird zombie thing? Chris replied, it's a D4 incident. Sometimes it happens to me. I just blame to escape. But other officers in the past weren't so lucky. They never came back. Thankfully, you only disappeared for a moment. Story 11. Even more deer shit. So yeah, you heard the title. The deer did something even bigger than last time. So, we saw yet another Splunker slowly driving through Harmony Way. I was about to stop him when I saw the deer. I heeded Chris's warning, and I backed up. It looked at the passenger. And then I noticed its head was starting to twist. And I mean, this thing was twisting rapidly. More rapidly than I'd ever seen anything ever move before. And then it leapt onto the car door, faced through the thing and ate the guy. I'm talking it gobbled the guy until there was nothing left. Not even bloodstains. And the worst part is, it ate the non-vitals first. So the guy was still alive when it finally finished him off. Dear lord, this thing is vicious. 
After that, it phased back through and vanished into thin air to God knows where. That vision still gives me nightmares to this day. Story 12, The Truth Behind Harmony Way. After the incident, Chris and I were walking around patrolling the area after we had reported the incident to Sheila. So Chris, it seems like we're not really needed in this area. Are you sure that it's to patrol? Nothing bad really goes on here. You're starting to think critically too. I've had my suspicions long before you came here. As we were talking, yet another passenger came by. Chris continued. One civilian dying one after another. From the hill, a portal appeared. And just like this, that guy is going to die, no matter how fast he goes. They always catch up. Harmony Way always catches up. It's sickening, you know. A tentacle started to appear. I signed up to protect the people. The tentacle grabbed the car. So we can't do anything against these things, or something happens. I'm not quite sure but the last time a partner of mine killed one of the anomalies. We could see the guy in the car screaming. He tried to get out, but the tentacle was in the way. Well, the next day, we never saw him again. He vanished without a trace. I replied, just like Sheila's dad. Exactly. You want to know my hypothesis, my explanation for all of this. The tentacle pulled the guy into the portal as the portal closed. The truth is, my friend, if the authorities here gave two shits about the people and their safety, they would have put up a ban from entering the area, claimed that it was dangerous, or that there is some serial killer on the loose or something. But they're not, because they're in bed with the Foundation. A tear formed from his eye. The truth is, Charles, those guys in the Foundation aren't the only test subjects. They're just the D-class subjects. But us? We're also subjects, and so are they. And all those casualties, all those deaths, there's just experiments to them. So they won't ever shut this place down. And because to them, we're not people. We're not even police officers. We're lab rats and so are the civilians. We're all supposed to die eventually. Foundation policy. Story 13. The meeting. So... This isn't going to be a story about the anomalies, sorry to disappoint, but you guys have been interested in the Foundation, and this sort of puts a closing to that aspect. This takes place a few years from when the original story took place, five years since I'd signed up to be a cop to be exact, including marriage. I was getting ready to head out when my wife called me. Yes, yeah, Sheila. We need to talk. I went over to speak to Sheila. Truthfully, uh, we've been trying to find the secrets of the Foundation for a while. You know, espionage and everything. We've gotten better at it. But what she said shook me to my core. I've got an email from someone. She muttered. What does it say? It was a file. A file? A file relating to my father. And... It said this. Here's what it said. Hello there. You may be wondering what this is. This is about your father, specifically his fate. Now, you may be wondering, who am I? All I will say is that I am close with the director. Who is the director? He is the one above the overseer. You see, there are multiple overseers, one for each branch. Each branch is assigned to a different anomalous area. Like Harmony Way or the Goatman's Bridge. But there's only one director. This director is in control of the entire facility. And is only directly in contact with the overseers. But that's not what you're interested in, is it? No. You're interested in your father. Subject H-503. He was particularly obedient. Although he was only truly obedient because of the promise of his child's safety. Now of course. This is ironic in hindsight. But the important part is that he ended up duped. See, he lived long after the disappearance, but he was the subject of something important. Namely, he wasn't class H. He was class F. Now, the official story we gave the officers is there is no class F. But why would we skip F? Class F personnel are victims of sacrifice. 
Now, a sacrifice to what exactly? Well, that shit-eating deer we see in every anomalous zone. And yes, it's the same one. D-01. We don't know where it came from, but we do know that it's probably one of the most powerful anomalies out there, and that it is able to summon a virus at will, and create new organisms from nothing. It could destroy Harmony Way, potentially the entire world, if it wanted to. Which is why we offer a sacrifice. It likes to eat. It's a hungry being after all. It likes the taste of humans the best, however. Which is why we offer a human to it the fourth of every month. And this year, it was your dad. For that, I am truly sorry. I put many people to death. I'm making up for this now. Show the world what this twisted foundation is truly behind. I understand their intentions, and I was behind them for the longest time. But there has to be another way. I will die from this. I have a bomb in my head that the director will put in, set to explode on his will. He sees this now. He will go after you. He will put all his effort into this. This is sensitive information. Perhaps I'm putting yet another innocent to death. But if the world knows this, he can't kill everyone. That's all I'm saying. Goodbye. The Harmony Way Overseer. After reading that, I looked to Sheila. You okay, babe? I asked. I'm better than I've ever been. I finally have closure. That's good. I hug her and she yells. Careful, the baby, remember? I nod and I apologize. Story 14. The Warning. Well, I suppose I'll mention an incident that happened during the time period. So Chris and I were out and about doing our jobs and... Then we saw it. It was the same doppelganger that I saw the last time. Don't, Don't cast, cast me, away. me away. I need, I to, need warn to warn you. you. I looked at Chris in confusion. He never says this. It's always scripted. The same thing he said the first time. He says it every time. Chris remarked. The doppelganger replied. I'm, I'm here to tell you. The director, the director knows. knows. He knows that he you knows snuck that in and tried to gain intel. To gain intel. And he knows you he about, knows the you about the rituals. I'm here to say, one, here thing. To say one thing. He turned towards me. He doesn't, he doesn't plan, plan to kill, to kill you. you. He, he plans, plans to break, to break you. you. He'll kill He'll everyone, kill you, everyone love, you love. And then wait for you to find new love. So he can break so your will, break over, your again, will over, again, over again. Until you offer yourself, you to, offer sacrifice. yourself to sacrifice. He crawled away after muttering. That, that is all. Chris asked. The director? I replied, long story. I felt sick to my stomach after that. Story 15. Loss. This must have started some of the most terrifying incidents that I've ever faced. So, we were patrolling the streets. This was our sixth year at this point. I had just gotten a call from my wife about our year-old daughter, Cecil. I looked at Chris and we were talking about Cecil. However, we saw something. Spikes. Sharp, knife-like objects reached from the ground, circling around us. Chris yelled, What is that? I should have known that this was odd when not even Chris knew what these things were. And frankly, neither did I. But we started to run from it so we could get to our cars. We got there and we started to go. As we floored the pedal, we managed to get out of Harmony Way. The thing couldn't get to us anymore. Well, we thought. Suddenly I heard a loud scream. I turned over and I saw Chris. He had a large spike through him. It reached all the way out of his mouth from the ground. It pulled him down and out of the car. I tried to chase the thing, but it was gone. Chris was gone. At least I thought. But that's for later. Story 16. That goddamn deer. After the incident, I got a new partner. I was experienced enough anyway. His name was Andrew, and he was fairly hot-headed and reckless. So when he saw the deer, Andrew thought it was a good idea to shoot it. As he raised his pistol, I put a hand on the top and I gently put his arm down on the pistol with it. Andrew, the first thing that you should know, don't hunt the things here. That's the Foundation's job. 
And secondly, the deer is especially dangerous. Sure enough, the deer grew wings and flew away. Where it stood were symbols. The Latin for new future. As I read this, I looked to Andrew and I pat his shoulder, remembering my first years of being an officer with Chris. I miss him sometimes. I can only hope that he's up there now. But as the deer said, as much hate as I had for that thing, he's right about my new future. Story 17 The Mimics I was still mourning Chris. He was a good friend after all. He was my partner. I had also lost my daughter recently, in an as of then developing event. But in the moment, I turned around and I saw Andrew investigating the rocks. The rocks? Andrew? Andrew looked up to me. You never know what you'll find. I remember how reckless I was back in my day. Fair enough. So I kept looking. But then we were called. Charles, Andrew, you're both called to Backstreet. Oh yeah, I'll mention that it was Halloween. So, Backstreet was where the monster was, another one of those paranormal hotspots. So we go there, and like I did back in my day, Andrew was ready to hunt the monster. I decide that I'm feeling reckless, so I go with him. We find a little girl. I need help finding my mommy and daddy. Can you help us? I recognize the little girl as my four-year-old daughter. Nonetheless, as charming and sweet as it sounded, I knew that it was a trap. My daughter was dead. Daddy, you're here. I'm here. No, I thought. It can't be real. I turned to see Andrew. That thing looks like my mom. It does? He looks at me with tears in his eyes. Yeah, she died last month. She was stabbed with a knife. We never found who did it. We followed the kid, with images of spikes in the ground flashing up repeatedly. It showed us a circle that Chris and I saw all those years ago. It turned into a massive beast, and we started opening fire. The bullets bounced off of it. We immediately stopped firing, and we simply watched the beast in horror, as it relished our fear. It stomped towards us. I turned to Andrew, who said that he had an idea. Hit the human body, dangling over the thing. I shake my head, still thinking of a little Cecil's smile, now plastered on the thing. I could practically hear her giggle, and I wondered for a moment if Cecil was alive and well, within the thing's body, trapped behind this monstrosity. I ran away, this thing practically taunting me. Andrew didn't stay behind either. I thought it would give me closure. Instead, I only gained a reminder of what I lost. Story 18 A Little Journey We weren't watching over Harmony Way. But at this point, it was seven years since I had first joined, still trying to find clues as to where this sharp man is. We had been looking at every nook and every cranny of the town to find where it is. We were patrolling the city in our car, and when we saw an old timer car, the car was speeding. So we got out to try and give the guy a ticket, but when we turned around, our car was just as old and just as timey. I turned to Andrew in confusion. This has happened only in stories that Chris had told me about times gone past. I told Andrew, be careful. Sure enough, we looked around and we saw the cars and everything were old. We got odd looks from the civilians who were wearing older suits. We asked around and realized we were in 1912. We looked around and tried to go to the foundation. The foundation doors were locked and the building itself looked the same but even the Harmony Way roads were newer. But we noticed some graffiti. Beware. We kept seeing more and more graffiti. He lives. Chris lives. Beware, ZB. Covered in spikes. Covered in blood. Watch for Sheila. Don't die. One more chance. Suddenly, the graffiti disappeared and the roads appeared as the same as before. I looked to Andrew confused. The car's back. We're back. So I went back home. It wasn't quite today. It was a few months before Cecil's death. Story 19. The Flooding. 
and I was setting up the camera for Cecil's room, prepared for the time where the man would strike. It was a few weeks now, and I was setting up a plan for when he would break into my house. I ended up getting a call from Andrew. Hey, you in Harmony yet? Uh, not yet, taking care of some personal business. I drove to Harmony Way, at least what remained of it. No longer was Harmony Way a street. It was a damn ocean. I'm talking water flooding the entire roadway, with the parking area being the only place not flooded. I called Andrew on my walkie-talkie, who was waving at me from the parking lot. Charles, what is this? Uh, you think I know? Yeah, you're the one who's been here for almost eight years. Fair, but I still don't know. Alright. I started to drive away. What are you doing? Getting ourselves a raft. I go to the store to get myself some rafts, but the flooding occurred in the town too. If you were to stack three of me on top in a row, that'd be almost the size of what we were dealing with. I kept running and running and running, and just when I was about to get exhausted, it stopped. The water just stopped. I walked back to Andrew to see if he was okay. Flooding? Charles, what on earth do you mean? I've been here waiting for you for two hours. I gave up trying to explain the situation with Andrew, or with anyone. Honestly, I've just learned that Harmony Way does weird shit for no reason. This was one of them. Story 20. Almost got him. This one was less, damn Harmony Way you crazy than the last one, but it's still relevant. It was the day. The day that I almost got him. I almost got the chart man. See, it was the day that he got Cecil. Keyword, got Cecil. Because when it was time for him to go in, I entered the room fully expecting him. No one was there, nothing. Just me and Cecil. She asked, Daddy, what's happening? I turned to her and I replied, Cecil, Daddy is trying to protect you. I stood there for a good hour. He was late, so I left the room. Immediately, I heard a scream. I turned back and I saw a blur jump out of the window, creating a large crash noise. Sure enough, Cecil was dead. I jumped out of the window and I shot at the figure, but it vanished into the ground. I looked around wondering where it was. I pulled out the walkie-talkie. Andrew, I think I see your guy, covered in spikes. That's how Cecil described him in the last timeline. I jumped in my car and I started heading his way. Damn it. Are you okay, Andrew? No, oh, he, he got away. I saw him approach the car. I pulled out my gun and I started to shoot. It stood still as if taunting me and blocked the attacks. I then jumped onto a nearby cliff and started climbing. Andrew took out a grappling hook and grabbed onto it. He pulled on it until a knife came out of the rock wall and cut the rope. It got away. It looked at Andrew. Andrew said, don't worry, sir. We'll get him. I know it. I smiled. For Cecil. Andrew replied, It's not too late, though. He didn't get Grandma yet. We can lay a trap for it. Story 21. The Clown. Andrew and I were patrolling the town once again, but suddenly, we saw a man in makeup approach us. He said nothing. He simply waved. I looked to Andrew and I looked back at the clown and I simply went back. He put his hand down. Shit, sorry man, we don't have any cash on us today. It was true, we didn't. But as we were walking past, we saw the clown again. He didn't move, he just appeared somewhere he originally wasn't. Andrew told him, Dude, we're broke. I blinked and suddenly we appeared in the middle of a warehouse. And the clown was there too. He bowed and he put his hand out again. I shook it and my arm was taken off. There wasn't even any blood. It was like taking an arm off of a Lego. The clown shook his head and wagged his pointed finger. He took my arm and he put it on a hook. It was only then that I noticed that there were thousands of arms on hooks. Each arm waved at me and I almost vomited right then and there. We blinked again and we were back on the street. My arm started to bleed and there was a ton of pain. I was taken to the hospital where I would get stitched back together, although I still didn't have a left arm.
Story 22. One Last Try. This story takes place long after my police career. In fact, about 10 years afterward. Andrew was still in the forest and was training his own apprentice. Andrew and I got together to try and fight off the sharp man. So far, he hasn't got to my grandmother yet. I've got no doubt he's going to do it now. I looked out to the hospital we were in. An elder lady lying in the bed. There were beeping sounds and people walking in and out from the building. I saw a figure dashing into the walls. I aimed my pistol at it. Andrew hit my arm. Dude, what are you doing? I put my gun away. Sorry, I swear that I saw something. Andrew shook his head. You keep doing that, we're going to get kicked out. Another dash from the same corner I saw the last figure dash to. Andrew asked me, You see that? I nodded. Sure enough, the old lady got a deep gash in her heart by the same figure. It appeared in front of us. There were silver knives all over it. A red dot as a single eye. We had a plan, luckily. We ran. The thing followed us as we got in Andrew's police car. We drove as the thing kept trying to attack us. The knives rose up from the ground, trying to take us out. As we got to Harmony Way, there was flooding. As the thing tried to jump up and leap towards us, we turned the car so the sharp man would charge into the deep blue. We thought that it was the end. It wasn't. It jumped out of the ocean, rust and all. We kept driving and the thing followed us. Our tires popped. Take a guess. We had to get out and the thing showed its face. Beneath the knives. The face of Chris. I put a gun to its face but the knives came back to cover it. It charged towards me and it tackled me. Andrew tried to get off but with no avail. Before it could kill me however, the face came back up. Go. Before it kills you. I got up and I aimed a rifle at its head. It closed and opened its knife face. I saw that I only had three rounds left. I fired once. Blocked. Fired twice. Blocked. Andrew threw a Molotov cocktail and it melted some of the leg. I used the opportunity to fire again. Hit the face. There was a large hole in his mouth, but there seemed to be no blood. Nothing poured out. As if it was just a corpse reanimated from the dead. Nonetheless, the sharp man rattled and shattered in chaos. It broke. The knives all dropped. There must have been thousands of them all on the ground. By the time the foundation appeared though, the knives were gone. Ever since that day, I've seen shadows dart past from time to time, and I've woken up with a cold sweat, occasionally having the odd feeling something was watching me. But nonetheless, Sheila and I live a happy life. We adopted another kid named Jack and he was currently off in college. She's dead now though. Not of the sharp man though. A more mundane but much more terrifying enemy. Alzheimer's. Andrew retired with a wife of his own, although he later died of cancer. As for me, well, I'm not sure. I'm thinking of one more journey down to Harmony Way before I head on over to see Chris again. As for you guys, thank you for everything.